Thank you. I grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan. I met my wife at age 17 while working at the Post House restaurant, where I cleaned the bathrooms, mopped the floor, washed the dishes. My future wife was a cook. We were owned by Greyhound, and it was at I-94 and Helmer Road. It was a stop for all the buses between Detroit and Chicago. During that time, I began to date her, and we were married at age 20. Now, originally, I left for college thinking I was going to go into psychology. But I worked at that restaurant for four years, and I kept getting ripped off. So I talked to a lot of the police and decided that I wanted to go into that for a career. So they talked me into transferring from Western to Kellogg Community College, getting a two-year degree, which at that time, a lot of police had no degrees. And then I worked for Albion College Public Safety. As soon as I turned 21, I got a job with Eaton County as a 21-year-old newlywed. During my time with Eaton County, I was shot at twice, I stopped an armed robbery, I faced butcher knives, I was certainly assaulted many times by people that were high on drugs. But I never shot anybody. I always talked them down. And I was very grateful that I didn't have to make that decision. Now, after 27 years, I decided I was unhappy with the incumbent sheriff. Uh, there was a lot of nepotism. There were in my opinion, things were done unfairly. So I decided I was going to run against an incumbent sheriff. Everybody said I had no chance of winning. I won quite easily. Then I went on to run the Eaton County Sheriff Department. And during that time, I tried to do things that were a little more innovative, like turning off cable TV in the jail. Because I found when you only gave inmates the Discovery Channel, they actually would go to school, or they'd go to AA, or they'd go to substance abuse. They'd go to self-help programs instead of sitting around watching cartoons or football or basketball. And it was quite successful. Also, during that time, I had the Potterville train derailment, a train that had five leaking propane cars next to a tank of sulfuric acid. They told me one spark in the city of Potterville would be gone. So I had to evacuate the entire city, probably one of, one of the biggest evacuations ever in Michigan history. As I came out of my command post that we had just set up, I walked out and saw 12 TV antennas, and that was my baptism under fire. I was on national TV for a week. That taught me a lot, taught me a lot. As I neared the end of 30 years of service and police work, almost 31, people started asking me to run for the House. We really need you to go to the House. Uh, got a representative that's made a lot of people unhappy because she seems to talk about doves all the time. <laughs> and uh, she was really into that, and that was fine, but uh, they really wanted somebody that would talk about other things. So I ran for the House. I wanted to serve three terms, then to the Senate for two terms. And I want to commend my staff for all of their hard work, because I'm a hard taskmaster. I want things done. You know, as a new rep, I had two brand new employees, and they're doing great. But I found out on the third month, they started walking on eggshells. And I'm like, what's going on? They said, well, don't you know that after three months, that's usually when people get fired? I said, really? I said, they said, yeah, you see two sergeants walking down the hall with a box. And that means somebody's being fired. And I said, I guarantee you right now, you're working for me. When you see two sergeants with a box, they will never be coming for you. And I made that promise to every employee I had. I will never treat you like that, because I was a sheriff, and I did hiring and firing, and I understand how to treat people. 
my chiefs. Four of the hardest working chiefs in Lansing. Kena Garrison, Jason Wadiga, Sandra McCormick, Jess Averill. They had great work ethic because they had to. They were working for me. And they took work home on the weekend. They took work home at night. And I want to thank them for all those efforts. Now, the only problem I had is they worked so hard, everybody in Lansing constantly tried to hire them away. And that's okay. Uh, I'm glad they were successful. Uh, the first three went to great jobs, and I'm sure that uh, Jess also will be going to one in January. Also during that time, I hired four National Guard. Now, it was a little tough on the office when people got called up to duty, but I'm very glad for that experience. Each one of these wonderful individuals uh, were serving our country with wonderful, wonderful service. As a former sheriff, I went right to work in the House. I thought it was expected. I really uh, didn't understand that I was a freshman. So during uh, my time in the House, it was under Governor Granholm. It was one term in majority and two terms in minority. I passed 36 bills, got three vetoes. But I was never, not even once, given a bill signing. I would request a bill signing. Governor Granholm would never grant it. And I really didn't know why. I really didn't. And, and so later, and in the Senate, I was fortunate to talk to one of her former inner office staff, who I will not name, who said, don't you know why Granholm hated you? And I said, I really don't. And he says, well, let me look. Let me start. He says, first, you told everybody she was building a boondoggle down the street for the MSP headquarters. He says, you pointed out that it was a, a no-bid deal uh, for a friend, and it shouldn't have happened. Okay, I understand that. So then you told everybody about her transferring money from the school aid fund away from K-12 to community colleges and then backing it out and putting it into the general fund and stealing it from the kids. He said, that didn't make her very happy. He said, then she decided that she was going to call the Christmas tree a holiday tree. You called a news conference out in front of the tree and demanded that it be called a Christmas tree. You even got a headline from somebody that said, you saved Christmas. And uh, she wasn't happy about that. He says, then somehow you found out the Michigan Department of Corrections had improperly released sex offenders, dozens and dozens of sex offenders, too early. They hadn't completed their term. He says, and somehow you put out a release and it got global media. In fact, I remember one of the headlines, and I'm quoting, I don't use this terminology, Assemblyman Jones says the Michigan prison system is all cocked up. That was from London, England. He says, then you went on, and right before she quit, when the state was in dire need of money, you pointed out to everybody that we were wasting $300,000 on Daniel Mohern's office and his staff and car and everything, and it wasn't needed. I said, okay, I guess I understand now why she was upset. He says, Rick, that's not the end of it. In her last two years of office, she'd get three reports every day. This is what the Senate did, this is what the House did, and this is what the flamethrower did. And that was your nickname. I said, really? If I'd only known that, I would have turned up the heat. My last two terms in the House, I served in minority, and I was treated pretty badly by the Democrat floor leader, constantly saying, you know, if you vote for this, we're going to run your bills, we're going to do this and that for you. Never happened. So my final speech in the House was, I leave minority and I'm going to majority, and I will never, ever treat a Democrat as I have been treated in minority. 
And I think I've kept that pledge. I have worked with, I believe, nearly everybody on the other side of the aisle. Some of us in packages of bills, and some where I simply assisted you with your common sense bills, getting them into law. I remember one with Coleman Young. He had a bill for Detroit female police officers. What was happening is if you got injured off duty as a male officer, maybe you're playing basketball at home with your kids, you broke your ankle, you got light duty. But if you were a female officer and you became pregnant, you had to burn your vacation time, your sick time, and then you lost your job. And Coleman, I was happy to assist you in passing that bill. Another bill I worked on was probably for the most liberal member of her body, Rebecca Warren. She had put in a bill simply giving women the right to breastfeed in public. What was happening is we had stores right here in my area. It might be 20 degrees below zero, and a woman would be modestly breastfeeding her baby with a blanket over, modestly, and they would still throw her out into the parking lot to freeze. Or they'd make her go into a bathroom. Why well, was I angry? I was angry, and I said, Rebecca, if you want, I'm going to help you pass that. And we did. We did. The messaging I used on that was, would you eat your lunch in a bathroom? You know, why wouldn't Republicans support healthy babies? And we do. I bet it's the only bill Rebecca ever had that was endorsed by the Michigan Right to Life. Now, I live, my house district's kind of tough. It goes back and forth. And at one point, Democrat staff told me, we're studying you. We can't figure out why you keep winning elections. Even in the Obama wave, we drove around and we saw Jones signs next to Obama. Why do Democrats vote for you? Of course, I didn't help them. But today, I'm going to reveal that secret. The reason is, is my wife hates coffee. So each and every day, I get up at 5.30, say, how much fun can I have today? And I have coffee with constituents. Sometimes I pick up a senior that can't drive. One senior's blind. And we go to coffee. And we talk about issues. We talk about all the, all the different things we're doing down here. And I can tell you, for me, it really works. I can recall in the house, Chris Ward came up to me one time. This is as a freshman. And he was angry at me because I wasn't always voting party line. And he says, damn it, Jones, you're not a Republican. You're a damn populist. And I said, well, thank you, Chris. But actually what I am is a common sense Republican that knows how to get reelected. I vote my district. Found another great way to stay connected to people was volunteering my time. Now, my parents taught me. My dad's a World War II veteran. He's 90. My parents taught me, if you're healthy, you should be donating your time and helping people. And if you don't, shame on you. So I took that to heart. For a decade, I served Meals on Wheels. For two decades, I volunteered for the Special Olympics, sometimes taking the athletes up to CMU for the summer games and staying with them for three days, sometimes uh, jumping into cold water, and I want to thank everybody that helped me, either by jumping or by donating to the Special Olympics for the seven polar plunges we've done in front of the Capitol. I've done nine for the Special Olympics, and I can tell you it's a lot tougher when you chop a hole in the ice and jump in the lake than it is out here in this uh, pool of water. But they're all cold. Another thing that I did at my parents' urging was start donating blood at an early age. And why not? I, I mean, if I'm healthy and I'm all negative and I can help somebody, I, I think that's what I should do. So I haven't quite reached my goal. I wanted to reach 24 gallons for the 24th district. 
I'm at 23 and a half. I've got the, a lot of scars to prove it. Occasionally I come in with bandages and gross out my chief. But probably the volunteer work that I've done that most affected me was I've been a volunteer for my community hospice for two decades. They just made me the president two weeks back of, of the board. But I actually, uh, before we had a hospice house, we would go out and sit with a dying person so their family could get out for respite because some people just get trapped. They have a mom or a dad or a spouse that's dying and they need respite. And I can tell you, I have learned more from those dying people than probably anybody. Some people are able to talk right up to the end. And they tell you what's really important in life when their life is almost over. One of the more interesting assignments I got, I knocked on a door one night and the chairwoman of the Eaton County Democrats opened it up, Rosemary DePonio, and she said, Rick, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a volunteer and I'm gonna sit with your mother. And she couldn't believe it. So she served me a cup of coffee. It said the Democrats coffee cup. And I sat in her living room under a sign that said only Democrats allowed in this home. And I watched her mother so she could get out of the house and go to an MSU game. I did that several times. And while we were on opposite sides of the aisle, we both realized it's not about being a Democrat or Republican, it's about serving people. And I worked on many great bills on the Republican side of the aisle, and I appreciate all of your help in getting a lot of these things done. Back in the House, we passed law and it was that you had the right to defend yourself from rape or death. Simple concept. Simple concept we should have learned from 1925 when in Detroit people were going to lynch Dr. Ozzie and Sweet. And that was called the Castle Doctrine at that time. A man's home is his castle. And today it's wherever you legally can be. You have the right to defend yourself. I think that's an American right. I'm surprised we had to codify it into law, but you know, we had some judges that said, well, if somebody breaks into your house, you should retreat to your bedroom, call 911, and maybe hide under the bed. No, you have the right to defend yourself and your spouse and your children, your family. The most shocking bill I worked on was with Jeff Hansen. I can still feel the sting of that taser. The veterans' bills were so important, so important to our veterans. I had a man who just got done serving in Iraq, came into my office crying, and I said, sir, sit down, let's talk. What's the problem? And he says, well, I'm in the National Guard, and for five years I've had 50-50 custody of my son, my 10-year-old son, and I got called up and I came back and the Ingham County friend of the court has taken away my custody. And they said, you abandoned your son. I said, that can't be true. And I called up the Ingham County friend of the court and the people that I talked to said, well, yeah, you know, we really don't like those people in uniform. Well, I was a little angry. That bill passed unanimously and we restored veterans' rights. Another one happened more recently. We had a sailor serving in a nuclear submarine. He couldn't be in court. So the Michigan judge was going to put out a warrant for his arrest. We took care of that. Thank you. And one of the other recent ones was we had a liquor commission that decided that if you were a member of the VFW post or the American Legion post, that you were only a member of your home post. You had no right to visit other ones, even though that had been the practice for 50 years. 
Thank you for helping me to fix that. We had police officers in the state that were allowed to quit, hop to another job, and get in trouble at department after department. The media called it the gypsy cop law or the bad cop law. Thank you for helping me strengthen law enforcement in this state to make sure that every department keeps records and before an officer goes to another department, they release everything to the next department, even if he or she resigns. And the bills that we worked on that had worldwide impact were the bills to ban female genital mutilation. Now, I want to thank you, Margaret O'Brien, for all of your hard work on that. I tell you, my friends, we got real worldwide notice on that. They read about us in Europe. They read about us all over the place. We were taking a stand for women that this is never going to happen in Michigan again. A stronger stand than what the federal government had taken. And I appreciate all of your work. I was honored. I don't know why I was chosen, but I was asked to go over to Oxford University in London and lecture to a global group and how we did it when other states haven't done it or other countries haven't done it. This week, I was invited to go on Voice of America, the African uh, division, and spoke about female genital mutilation. The world is watching us. They want to know how we accomplish this. I'm hoping that will be my career in 2019, helping other states, perhaps other countries, stop this horrible practice. And I also want to stop child marriage. I mean, it's just horrible in this state that one parent, one parent can sign and you could be married at age 14. You can't even sign a contract until you're 18. We've got it started. Margaret O'Brien and I got it started. And I know it's going to get picked up next year. Uh, Representative Graham Filler and Representative Sarah Anthony are already working on it. You know, I want to thank not only my staff, I want to thank every member, every member of my committee. I know you worked hard. Sometimes I brought you in early. And we'll probably have another committee next week. But thank you, because you worked so hard that the House had to create two committees to handle the workload. And I'm proud of you and all of the work you put in. I want to thank the Randy Richville and Arlen Meekoff. Both of them were great leaders in the Senate. But sometimes Randy would get a little peeved at me. He had a strange rule that the chairman wasn't supposed to necessarily take up every bill assigned to his committee. So I got into a little trouble when I took up an Arlen Meekoff bill. His staff got angry at me, but they got over it. I told Randy, and I want to thank Arlen for his policy, that if you put a bill into my committee, that means I can run it. And if I don't run it and you want to discharge it, that's fine. I'm fine with that. But please don't put any bills in my committee that you don't want me to run. I'm very proud, very proud that I never, ever let anybody tell me how to vote. Not Maddie Maroon, not Joel Ferguson, not even Dick DeVos. I listen to the people in the 71st District and the 24th District. Now, next week, I'm going to be putting up the Nativity. And I understand the satanic group is going to bring in a statue of a goat, but you know what? That's okay. I hope that the nativity represents the light 
If they want to represent the darkness, that's okay. But I want to tell you, this is not because I don't believe in diversity. I'm very happy to have other religious displays on the Capitol lawn. I loved it when Representative Calton put up a menorah. And I would welcome other religious displays. I think that's wonderful that we celebrate our, our diversity. I'm very proud to have invited, for the first time, a Hindu holy man and a Sikh holy man to open the Senate in prayer. And I have become good friends with the, those two communities in my district. I've been to weddings, unfortunately a funeral, and I've really gotten to know them. In fact, the, the Sikh community had a uh, conference here in Lansing, brought me in, put me on their TV. Uh, they asked for it. I didn't ask for it. Uh, but they explained to me that I was speaking to 25 million people around the world. And that was pretty good. It was pretty good. I told them how we welcome legal immigration here in Michigan because we need more workers. And we need more young people studying in our schools to do great things. I told them they were welcome. Finally, I want to close with, it's been 14 great years, and I appreciate all your help. Thank you.